tell us it was policy and it was procedure. Uh, that things were pretty dire. And they rushed us over to speak with the neurosurgeon. Uh, we immediately ran another CT scan. Uh, worse than the one um, at the previous hospital. He told us that it had caused two blood clots in her brain. With a traumatic brain injury, uh, we didn't know whether things were going on because of the brain or things were going, were going on because of sedation, um, because of the stroke. Uh, she had braces um, on her legs and on, um, again, still the brace on her neck. Everywhere she went, she had to wear a helmet. She had to wear what they call a, 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 a gate belt. Um, she could not go anywhere without it. She could not leave the floor of this rehab unit um, until she was able to um, be mobile. But she started to inspire everybody on this floor. The therapists, the other kids, myself, the other parents.
Somebody say water. water. And he said, come. Somebody say come. come. And when Peter had come down out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Just for a quick talk this evening, amen. If you don't mind, look at your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor. Hey. Come on, look at somebody and say, hey, neighbor. Hey. Be, up. Be up. Good chief. Good it said that the definition for the word cheer is just what we just got through doing. It said to shout for joy or to praise or to encourage, to motivate, to inspire, to give comfort. Amen. So just from what we heard, what God done for this family, what is he ready to do for somebody else in this building? So I just want to tell somebody today, amen, opponent this evening to be a good cheer. Is there anybody going through anything about this evening? Come on, somebody. But my Bible tells me, amen, that there was Jesus was praying up in the mountain. Bible said that he had sent his disciples out and told them to go to the other side. My Bible tells me that in the fourth watch between the hours of three and six in the morning, that Jesus began to notice that his disciples was in trouble. Is there anybody in trouble in here today? The word trouble means to be worried or to be concerned about something you cannot control. But I just come to serve notice today to tell you to be of good cheer. Because your answer is on its way. And your answer is coming in the form of Jesus Christ. Amen. So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, be of good cheer. Your answer is on its way. And my Bible begins to tell that water couldn't even stop Jesus from getting to his disciples. So don't think our interstate 40 can stop him from getting to you. Don't think that the bank, amen, can stop him from getting to you. Don't think any circumstance can stop Jesus from getting to you. But I just want to serve notice to somebody in this place who's willing to be honest with God and simply say, I need to be cheered up. Churches are getting into Almighty God some praise in this place. For some grace and for some mercy. For he has done great things. Come on, can we thank God for the man of God, Elder Xavier Griffin of the Fort Smith District. God bless you, man of God. Hallelujah. At this time, amen, this was not on program. No one told me to say it. But I would be remiss if we did not honor some leading ladies, even though this is a men's conference. Can we thank God for the first lady of the second jurisdiction of our Come on. Lady Anderson, sharp as a tech. I'm telling you, there is not a time 
she ain't dressed to impress. Hallelujah. And certainly we do honor our state supervisor, Mother Watkins. Come on, can we bless God for her? And to all of the union ladies, district missionaries, God bless you. We thank you for your support. Come on, let's thank God for them. Hallelujah. At this time, our brotherhood chairman, Elder Robert Jones, is coming. Let's thank God for him. I invited my friend, Bishop Linwood Dillard, and he drove all the way from Memphis. Now he's been sitting here patiently looking at all these people getting his word ready. And the other thing I need to say is a lot of times we lead too fast. If we were at a ball game and going into the overtime, everybody in this building would still be here. Whether it's basketball, whether it's football. It wouldn't be one person complaining. It wouldn't be one person getting up leaving. And I'm simply saying, sometimes if you get up, you're going to miss your blessing. Because see, the blessing don't have to come from what my nephew said or what the inspirational speaker said. It don't even have to come from Bishop Dillon. It could be somebody can shake your hand or speak a word over your, in your life right out there and can bring a miracle into your life. So sometimes when you get up and walk through those doors, you miss your miracle. So as a brotherhood chairman, I do want to say thank you. I know y'all said we started late. We did, and I'm going to apologize for that. But please stay and hear the word from this great man of God. God bless you. Well, the chairman has spoken. Come on, let's thank God for Elder Jones. And we're going to hang in there. Why? Because I know there's a word from the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. At this time, we are getting ready to have the introduction of our prelate and hear the voice of our prelate. But given that honor, amen, is the second administrative assistant, amen, Superintendent Leroy Williams. Let us thank God for him as he comes to present, amen, the Honorable Bishop Frank A. Anderson. For the sake of time, everybody stand. And receive one of the greatest leaders in the Church of God in Christ. That's not other than Bishop Frank J. Anderson, Jr., the jurisdiction of prelate of the second jurisdiction of Arkansas. My bishop! And I love my bishop! And I'm not funny either. Bishop Anderson. Please be seated, please be seated. What a blessing, what a blessing, what a blessing. Amen, what a blessing. Would you look at somebody and tell them that uh, there are miracles all around. Amen. Thank God for Sister, Sister Cam. I think that's what they call you, Cam. Praise the Lord. Amen. You have a story to tell your daddy. Your daddy told it night, but you tell it the rest of your life. Yeah. You tell it the rest of your life what God has done for you. And through your life, many young people, many young people will walk down the aisle and give their life to the Lord. God preserve you for a reason. He wanted to not only show the family, but he wanted to show the world. Yes. Amen. I'm a miracle worker. There's not anything hard for God. God bless you. God bless you. As uh, Chairman Jones said, please do not leave. Please do not leave. We have a preacher in the house. Yes. I'm, talking, I'm talking about somebody that's a young man that, that, that preached like he's about to go crazy. Amen. Men stop. I say, you ought to be arrested. <laughs> Listen, tonight, 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 we honor our chairman, Chairman Robert Jones, for a job well done. We look out over this past auditorium and see all of you, and amen, to see all of these men, all the men stand, all the men stand, all over the place. All the men. All of the men, all of the men, praise the Lord. All of the men, praise the Lord. All, all over the place.
face, look at all these men. Amen, amen, amen. When was the last time you've been to a service and saw more men than women? That wasn't the ball game. <laughs> be seated, praise the Lord. So tonight, tonight, we want to be a blessing. We want to be a blessing to the chairman. Listen, if you, you sit out here, but you don't really know how much it costs to put on a service like this. All the money that is raised, you think that is going in their pocket. If it's there for a little bit. It's, it's, it's data in, data out. Amen. If, uh, if I tell him tonight after the service, I need $2,000, he got to give me $2,000. Bishop, if Bishop, stand up, Bishop Dillon. If Bishop Blake called the two of us and said, be in Los Angeles Sunday morning, and we supposed to be in our own pulpit, and said, uh, we're going to be trying to find a ticket tomorrow to be in Los Angeles, and if he tell us to bring $5,000, we go on with the five. Not counting that expensive round trip ticket. Amen. So when you help your leaders, you're helping them to do things so it will not have to come out of their own pockets. Amen. And some of the brothers, you have not paid your $75. Not paid your $75 to help to carry on the Brotherhood Department for the entire year. So would you do that tonight and add 25 to it tonight? Um, amen, since it's so close to 100. <laughs> just, just do that. And uh, we're getting ready now. We're getting ready to receive our offering. I know the superintendents. I know the pastors. I know that you all are ready. Amen. Now, who's on for offertory prayer? It's the other night. Come on. The fight, I know you don't want to miss it here. Praise the Lord. Come on, son. All the way from Lake Billy Gardens. Gracious Father, we want to thank you tonight. Lord, we have been to South We have been waiting. We have been waiting for this time. From the time that we heard that Bishop Dillard, uh, the last time he preached for us in our con convocation, he was superintendent, uh, Ben Wood Dillard. But now, praise the Lord, he is Bishop, President of the, of the Metropolitan, Tennessee Metropolitan. Amen. Did not wait until one of the prelate passed, made transition. But he went and uh, went out and 35 or 40 men said that we want to follow you. Amen. Started his own jurisdiction. And amen. We thank God he's doing a wonderful job. Showed me some, showed me some pictures of uh, the convocation, the first convocation. And the house was packed out. And we thank God. We thank God for him. Chairman uh, Jones from reaching out, amen, for reaching out to pull him in to be our speaker on tonight. And, the, and, and, and uh, because the time is moving, uh, I will not go through the bio, but uh, he is the AIMS chairman, international AIMS chairman from the Church of God in Christ worldwide. And uh, I, thought that, I thought that I had heard him preach, I heard him preach a lot of times, but in the aims meeting, you have done yourself. Amen. Not only did you have the anointing, but you had words. Some people just there. But you had words. We praise the Lord. And uh, we're not going to allow the python while you're here in Arkansas to squeeze you. Amen. But we're going to. We're going to pray for him as he comes. We thank God for all of you that are here on tonight. And listen, uh, you will not regret that you stay. One of the things that I'm praying for, not only, not only at our local churches, 
not only in the district, the jurisdiction, and the national, that we would stay to hear the benediction. Some of you haven't heard the benediction, and I don't know when. <laughs> because you leave before the benediction, and you never get a chance to hear it. Sometimes the benediction of prayer would be the thing that you need to sustain. Amen. So after the choir would have given their selection, we're moving fast. Amen. But we want them to have all the time. Have all the time that you want. Preach your sermon. Preach the one that the Lord gave you. And uh, we're going to stay here with you. We're going to stay here with you. And we're going to stand after the choir. We're going to stand and we're going to receive our great speaker, the Bishop Linwood Dillard, International AIM Chairman, Prelate of Tennessee Metropolitan Church of God in Christ. Would you receive him after the choir? I bless you, the men choir. One of those short songs. <laughs> for the riches of this land. Neither, Lord, is my prayer that high men may know my name. But, Lord, give me a clean heart that I might serve thee. Lord, fix my heart that I might be pleasing unto thee. I recognize that I'm not worthy of all of these blessings. But just give me a clean heart. And I vow for the rest of my life I will follow thee. Please, Jesus, anoint these lips of clay tonight that we may speak as an oracle of Christ. Hide us behind the glorious cross. Don't allow the people to see me, but only thee. Have your way, Lord. Drop a Holy Ghost bomb in the midst of your saints. Let your glory be revealed. We thank you for what you've already done. Thank you for what you're doing right now. By faith, we clap our hands in advance. What you're about to do in this let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you're my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, before you take your seat, will you shake somebody's hand next to you and say, neighbor, neighbor. tell him God is up to something, and you're right in the middle of it. Now tell him something good. Tell somebody else something good is getting ready to happen to you. Anybody believe me or clap your hands like the devil in this place. In this place. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to Arkansas Second Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ. Anybody else glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Come on, clap your hands and give God a great praise. Certainly I am blessed and highly favored to stand before such great people and especially all of these men of the Lord who are here tonight. Uh, usually when you see men gathering like this, uh, is at a mosque with a number of Muslims. But we're not in a mosque tonight. We're the Church of God in Christ. I think we ought to give God praise for all of these men that are present in honor of you. And it speaks of the leadership of this jurisdiction, a man of God who is a general, a father in the faith, a man of God that have always been encouragement, an encouragement to me and 
uh, pushing me and encouraging me. And I'm so blessed to be able to look up to him. Literally look up to him. He's a tall guy. Uh, we appreciate him. He is an anointed preacher. Uh, of course, we're excited about the founder celebration of the Church of God in Christ, Honorable Bishop Mason. And September 9th, Bishop Anderson, Frank Anderson, will be ministering during that celebration. I know you love him. I know you honor him. But can we celebrate one more time the filling of Arkansas Second Jurisdiction? A pivotal of Father and the Faith, the Bishop Frank Anderson. Let's praise God for Bishop Anderson tonight. God bless you. We honor you. Thank you so much for this opportunity and to all of the administrative assistants, superintendents, the pastors and elders, to the supervisor in our absence. And what can we say about our lovely First Lady? Amen, First Lady Anderson tonight. Somebody had it right when they mentioned a few moments ago, she's always dressed up. Amen, we honor her. And all of the First Ladies, all of the district missionaries, my friend over there, God bless you. And uh, there's so many special people that I share in ministry with in this great jurisdiction. I looked around and saw Brother Bill, who heads up the disability yes, ministry. And our national angel mission, we honor you tonight. Superintendent Robinson, we worked with him on various committees and looked around and saw uh, the Superintendent Michael Jones. Amen, the Arkansas third, and he is the executive secretary of the International Aim Convention of the Church of God in Christ. We honor you, and I'm so glad to see my parents tonight. Have them in the house of the Lord. Elder Linwood and Brother Maurice Miller, will you all stand and can y'all help me honor my mother and my father. Amen. We celebrate them on tonight, and we give God great praise. I honor my wife in her absence. Uh, she sends her love and her prayers, and Last but not least, can we give it up for Jesus Christ, the Savior of the whole world? Hallelujah. All the earth is Jesus, we are here. Will you stand to your feet? Will you stand to your feet? I know the hour is late. Amen. And I know that uh, many of you are weary, but I believe there's a word from the Lord. Amen. I enjoyed that testimony tonight from the brother of God's miraculous life. God is still doing in the earth. First Kings chapter 19, last but not least, I want to honor Elder Robert Jones, sheriff of the Brotherhood Ministry of this great jurisdiction, and his lovely wife, amen. Sister Jones, we honor you all. Uh, they are some incredible people, just humble and love the Lord, hardworking. And uh, now he is one of the most intricate uh, individuals in the life of the men's ministry of the Church of God in Christ coming out of Arkansas, Seven Jurisdiction. Thank you so much for your friendship and the brotherhood that we share. First Kings chapter 19 and verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Look at this henpecked husband. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went, ran for his life and came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And the prophet prayed and listened to the prayer of God's preacher. He requested for himself that he might die, and said, Lord, it is enough. Take away my life. Well, I'm not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then, then an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water in his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. God is not through with you. 
because the journey is too great for thee. God bless the hearers, readers, and doers of this most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk about when men grow weary. Can everybody say, when men grow weary? Not only will this, I believe, be a blessing to the men, but I believe the women and all of the people of the Lord. And so I can also say, when saints grow weary. Does everybody say, when men grow weary? I've come to discover that one of Satan's most effective weapons, especially against church leaders and men and people and in general and especially persons in authority, one of his most effective weapons he uses is discouragement. Yeah. Now I know a lot of you are not going to admit that you've ever been discouraged before because you want everybody to believe you're Superman, you're Superwoman. But every now and then throughout your life, there will be a season where the enemy will come against you to bring discouragement. And it has been sagaciously suggested that winners never quit and quitters never win. Keeping in mind that when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. But on this Christian journey, how many know we are on a journey? On this Christian journey, there are bound to be moments when we want to quit. And to make sure I'm not in the strange, foreign place, how many people ever thought about quitting before? Even if you didn't quit, you felt like quitting before. And there are bound to be moments where you feel like quitting, Dr. Reed, and when we want to give up because of the circumstances. And every now and then, something or someone may try to block our paths and and then the enemy will tempt us to throw up our hands in submission. But my brothers and my sisters, I want to remind us today that when things go wrong, and sometimes they will, when the road we're trotting seems all uphill, when funds are low and debts are high, when we try to smile but we have to cry, when your cares are pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, and look at somebody and say, just don't quit. Uh, you're talking to the wrong person. Look at somebody else on the other side and say, just don't quit. Well, Brother Preacher, why should I quit? Because our God is bigger than any problems. He's stronger than any adversary. And I found out that we serve a God who is willing to fight our battles for us. So whatever we do on this Christian journey, there is no time to quit. If you don't remember anything else, I'll tell you tonight, remember, don't quit. Jesus said that he that endured to the end, the same shall be saved. I'm reminded of uh, verse 4 in the hymn, we'll understand it better by and by where he says, temptations, hidden snares, often take us unawares and our hearts are made to bleed for a thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best. But we'll understand it better by and by. How many know that in life there will be some experiences that will leave you in a quandary, in a place of asking God why? Can I get a witness in here? Not only will you be in a place, a position where sometimes you will ask God why the test, even if you check in with Apostle Paul, he had uh, an experience where he asked God not only why, but he asked God whatever this is that is happening to me, he said move it from me. Matter of fact, he says that except, except I be uh, exalted above measure, notice what he said, that was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Then he interprets what the thorn in the flesh was. He said, a messenger from Satan that was sent to buffet me. When you look at that word buffet, it means to irritate, to agitate. He says, there's something that is sticking me, that is making me uncomfortable, something that irritates me and agitates me. And you know the story. He said, I went to the Lord three times and ask him to remove this thorn. First time he prayed, didn't hear anything. Prayed a second time, still didn't hear anything. Then the third time he heard something, but it really wasn't what he was expecting to hear. The Lord didn't say, okay, Paul, I'm gonna remove the thorn, but he told him, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. 
For when in your weakness is my strength made perfect. In other words, God reveals a couple of things to Paul. He says, number one, I'm not going to remove the thorn. Can I tell somebody tonight that God will not always remove what's ailing you or challenging you or what's making you cry or what's making you feel as if something strange is happening to you? But God said there is a purpose with the pain. I tell you, look at somebody say, there's a purpose with the pain. Number one, God understood the proclivity of Apostle Paul to get arrogant and high-minded. So God says, I'm going to have to allow a thorn in the flesh to keep you up. Now, I know y'all don't want to admit that there's some proclivities that you have, but how many of you know that when God saves us and sanctifies us, sometimes he has to take us through more processes of sanctification because there may be some areas, hallelujah, that we need God to totally deliver us from. The reason why we have so much trouble sometimes in the church is because there's some people that have been saved, but they still need a little more deliverance. Have a witness here. Don't have enough patience. Sometimes we talk too much. Sometimes we don't know how to forgive others. And what God would do is allow you to go through some things. And if you allow it to, it will teach you and develop you into some into the individual that God wants you to be. So He says, Paul, I've allowed this thorn to be in your flesh to keep you humble. But then the next thing that he reveals to Paul, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, to be able to make it, you don't only need the thorn to be removed, but I'm going to give you the grace and the unction and the ability to endure the pain. I'm preaching better than y'all saying in this house. What are you saying? God literally says to Paul that the reason why this thorn is there, yes, is to keep you humble, but also you can handle it because of the grace I've given you. See, some people will look at you and they're trying to figure out why you haven't broken down yet, why you haven't left the church yet, why haven't you backslidden yet, why haven't you lost your mind, why haven't you thrown in the towel, why haven't you walked away from it all, but what they don't know is that you have grace to do what you do. Look at somebody say, I have the grace for it. When other people are killing themselves over you, standing under the pressure, and you're almost like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. See, in this life, let me tell you something. It's not all about how many punches you can throw. But I want to know, brothers, how many punches can you take? Can I get a witness in here? We're living in an hour when we, people can't take anything. We say we have been persecuted, but I dare you to go back and study church history. And look at the New Testament church with the apostles. We can't stand somebody rolling their eyes at us. And we're ready to leave the church. Somebody forget to call your name on the program. You got a whole attitude in the service. Somebody don't give you a certain seat, you ready to turn in your resignation. We call that persecution. Glory to God. We call that persecution, but when you go back and look at the scriptures, you will see where they were stoned, they were beaten, their heads were cut off. I wish I had a church in here. We can't take anything, but it's about how many punches you can take. In other words, out of all the devil did to you, you're still here. Look at somebody say, out of all the devil did to you, you're still here. Then you, once you understand that you can say, like the psalmist, it was good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might have learned your steps. See, you know you've grown in God when you can celebrate what you've been through. You know that you, you mature, you stretch because you can take some stuff. And on this journey, you're going to go through some things. Some things will catch you by surprise. And what the enemy will want to do is to bring you into a place of discouragement. Now, there, there are 
have, there are three types of discouragement. Number one, the first type or the first stage of discouragement is mild discouragement. Everybody say mild discouragement. That's when you have minor problems and minor pressures and they affect your emotions. That's where the enemy, he attacks your emotion. You don't know if you're happy or you're sad. You don't know if you want to laugh or you want to cry. I wish I had a witness in here. That's called mild discouragement, but then you also have strong discouragement. That's where you have major problems or pressures which affect your spirit. Come on here, somebody. It affects your spirit so much so until other people start noticing that your spirit is a little different. It's a little, it's a challenge because of what is happening around you. Notice that discouragement comes for your emotions, it comes for your spirit, but then the third stage or type of discouragement is disabling discouragement, where there is overwhelming problems or pressures, and listen what happens, it drains you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Why don't you talk back to me in here? In other words, when the enemy comes for you, he wants to attack all of you. See, sometimes what you don't realize, sometimes the enemy will attack your body, but what he really is going out of is your mind and your spirit. I wish I had a witness in here. It's not that the devil loves your car so much that he calls your car to break down. It's not that the enemy is so concerned about your materials. He'll, he'll rob you of material things, but he wants to really get to your mind. How many know when the enemy gets to your mind and to your spirit, it will manifest in your body? A lot of the sicknesses that people are dealing with in their, in their physical body, it really has started in their minds and their spirit. When your mind and your, your spirit is disrupted and it is, it is disabled and it is discouraged, it weighs over in your body. That's why some people deal with high blood pressure. Some people are having heart attacks and strokes. Some people even have cancers in their body because they don't know how to deal with the pressures of this life. And the reality is that at the base of every discouragement is a lie from Satan. I wish I had a church in here. See, fear, unbelief, bitterness, and self-pity, condemnation are all based on lies. If the enemy can get you and convince you that a lie is the truth, he captures you that you start believing what is not even real, not even true. And so it takes over your mind, your heart, and your spirit, and you find yourself in a place of discouragement. What's that a church in You find yourself in a place of discouragement. I'm just about finished here in our text. We see where God has been using this prophet by the name of Elijah. Elijah, when we're introduced to Elijah, we don't really know a whole lot about his background. Usually when we're introduced to people, especially in the Old Testament, we know their father's name. We, we know their tribe that they come from. But the Bible lets us know at least two things about Elijah. Number one, we know that Elijah was from the land of Tish because when it introduces him, it says, and Elijah the Tishbite. The other thing that we know about Elijah is that he was a bald-headed preacher. Now, preacher, why do you say that you know he's a bald-headed preacher? Because one day while he was walking down the walkway down the street, there were some children laughing and pointing at him and laughing and said, look at the bald-headed preacher. And uh, let me tell you something, it's dangerous when you start meddling with God's men and his women. The Bible said God anointed three she-bears and came out and devoured the children because of them making fun of the bald-headed preacher. Nonetheless, this bald-headed preacher shows up at a time where the nation of Israel has fallen into a place of apostasy. They have denounced the morality of the kingdom of God because King Ahab, who was a rightfully so in the lineage of being a king, but he married a strange woman. She was not strange because of her physique. She was not strange because of her looks, but she was strange because of where she came from. And let me tell you something, you need to be careful who you hook up with. 
You need to be careful of what people's origin because they can influence who you are. The Bible said that this sister by the name of Jezebel, she introduced idol worship to the nation of Israel and caused an entire nation because her husband would not be a real man and take ownership and responsibility and leadership of his house and the nation. And so she comes in and turns the whole nation upside down against God. We had a church in here. And I know many times when we hear about Jezebel, we think about a woman with big earrings, with makeup on her face. She's flamboyant, but let me tell you something, Jezebel is not a woman. But Jezebel is a spirit. We had a church in here. It is a demonic spirit. A man can have a Jezebel spirit. A woman can have a Jezebel spirit. Because that demonic spirit, it, its whole thing is to intimidate and create fear and cause men and women of God to withdraw. Jezebel steals your vision. She will even make you depressed and anxious when there is nothing significantly different in your circumstances. And if there are different circumstances, the spirit of Jezebel will tell you that they are insurmountable, impossible, and overwhelming. Jezebel will make you feel like dying when in reality you are God. God's man and God's woman of the hour. Jezebel's witchcraft will attack key leaders in her targeted area through intimidation. And those under attack may awaken one morning to find it takes a whole lot more to try to breathe and look like all your joy has departed and, and demonic voices will echo in your mind telling you that something is wrong with you and then suddenly you'll find yourself in, in unreasonable anxiety, fearing tragedy and fearing death and, and much of what we call depression is really the spirit of Jezebel. See, Jezebel wants to paralyze with fear and condemnation, depression, apathy, or whatever it takes to get you to quit and withdraw. And the only answer for those under Jezebel's attack is perseverance. Perseverance in the battle. Look at somebody say, you got to hold on, you got to hold on. I want you to know that every with the spirit of Jezebel that wants you to throw in the towel, that wants you to walk away. See, the spirit of Jezebel wants to control through intimidation. And the spirit has a deep hatred of true spiritual authority and uses emotional pressure and witchcraft and obsessive sensuality in his pursuit of power. Jezebel wants to be in charge. And so whatever that spirit has to do to try to make the leadership look bad and authority looks bad. She cannot cohabitate as a matter of fact. When you look at the name Jezebel, it literally means with cohabitation. In other words, their spirit can't live with anybody else. I wish I had a witness in here. That's why you'll see a spirit of Jezebel operating in the church. And one thing that their spirit will do will always come against the pastor, always come against those in spiritual authority and try to misguide people. See, what we don't understand and sometimes that spirit a man can control not only just in the pulpit but he'll sit out in the seats you know some people are under the spell of Jezebel they can't even clap unless they look over at the person that got the spirit they can't get in the service unless they look over the seats is it alright for me to shout now is it alright for me to serve now I wish I had a church in here but I came all the way to look like Arkansas to say that the spirit of Jezebel is about to die the spirit of Jezebel is about to be broken from your life, from your ministry, from your family, that which controlled you, that which intimidated you, that which made you back up. God said it is over. I need you to tell three or four people it's over, it's over, it's over. What made you cry, you get ready to shout about. What made you feel like you can't take any more thoughts and I'm going to use it to help a picture. I'm going to have a church in here. The nation of Israel fell into apostasy. So much so until the prophet of God went and stood before Ahab and said, As I live, said God, you haven't paid your water bill. God said, I'm going to cut your water off for three years and six months except according to my word. Took an invisible key and locked up the water that it would not rain. 
a famine hit the land. And you know the story of how God sustained Elijah at the brook Cherith. Allowed a dirty bird, a raven, to bring him some sandwiches for a number of days. But then the brook dried up. Then the Lord said, it's time to move on. Can I pause right there to tell somebody you got to know when to move? When the brook, when the brook dries up. Some of you still trying to hang around when the brook is dry. Some of you still sitting up in dead churches, but the brook has dried up. Some people are doing the same old dead stuff over and over again, but the brook has dried up. God said, then I want you to go down this every path, and there I've caused a widow woman to sustain you. Then the Bible said, after three years and six months, he tells her, Ahab, I want you to get your prophets a bail. Meet me on Mount Carmel. And whatever God answers by fire, let him be God. You all know the story of how when they got on top of the mountain, the prophets of Baal built their altar. They went to dancing and wiggling and giggling and shouting and calling out to their God. No fire, no answer. But Elijah started meddling with them a little bit. So maybe your God went and took a little break. Call them a little louder and tell them that you need them. They start cutting themselves and call them a louder. Still no fire. No answer. Elijah said, I'm tired of this now. He said, break down this altar. And the Bible said that he built a brand new altar. Then he put a brand new wood and sacrifice on the altar. Then he said, I'm going to make it difficult for my God. Thou stood down with 12 barrels of water. By the time he got ready to pray, the Bible said that before he could say amen, fire came down from heaven and lit up the sacrifice. And so, in essence, God won the showdown in Mount Carmel. Next thing we see, uh, Elijah coming off the mountain. He said, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. He told the young man, I want you to go back. I want you to go and tell me what you see. The young man said, I saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand. Glory to God. He said, I want you to go back and look seven times. I wish I had a witness in here. In other words, he didn't see anything at first, but he only heard something. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, it's not about always what you see, but it's about what you hear. And he had I heard a sound of the abundance of rain. But after he calls fire down from heaven, after rain is coming back down, after he's defeated the enemy, his Jezebel shows back up again. And she sent word to Elijah and said, Elijah, just like you took out those other men, I'm going to take your life out this time tomorrow. Now it's amazing to me how this great preacher this great prophet goes from locking up the heavens where it would not rain. God sustains him through the famine. Let him call fire down from heaven and then allow him to unlock the heavens and it rain again. But when he hears a threat from this demon that tells him you're going to die, the Bible said when he saw that, in other words, he materialized and visualized what he heard. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Be, careful be careful what you visualize. See, the enemy will tell you you're going to die and can't live. He'll tell you you're always broke. And if you're not careful, you'll start seeing what the enemy said. But I got a question, Little Rock. Whose report do you believe? Shake somebody's hand like you're about to shake it off and say, neighbor. service with him. He told him, I want you to stay here in Judah. Now you know that Judah means praise, but notice the Bible said he left his helpers at Judah. I wonder what would have happened if he had stayed at Judah. But because he was so depressed, he ran away from the place of praise. And somebody in this room tonight, you're running away from where your help is. You're running away from where your deliverance is. He ran out into the wilderness and found a Judah between. And the Bible says that he began to pray.
pray and say, Lord, I don't want to live anymore. Lord, I don't want to stay on this field anymore. But take my life because I'm the only one. The preacher got so depressed that he became suicidal. He became to a point that he was ready to throw in the towel. But thanks be to God, he was ready to quit. But God was not ready to quit on him. I come to tell somebody tonight, don't give up on God. Because God won't give up on you. Shake somebody's head and say, sitting there and he fell into a sleep but God sent an angel and woke him up and said rise and eat notice that the Lord ministered to him in his physical body and then he told him that God is not through with you yet in other words he let him know that that God has more work for you to do so you cannot quit now but you need strength strength for the journey I need you to help me prophesy one more time and your neighbor say neighbor tell them God is not through with you yet God is not through with your ministry he's not through with your family he's not through with what he promised you so don't go weary God said I'm not through with you yet and he tells Elijah I want you to get up from here and meet me on the mountain and when he got to the mountain he saw earthquakes he saw wind and he saw fire but God wasn't in the earthquake he wasn't in the wind he wasn't in the fire but a small still voice began to speak to Elijah and said, Elijah, I want you to go and get some help and anoint Elijah. And then I want you to anoint other kings. In other words, when the enemy told you that you were over, that you were defeated, God said, get ready. I'm not through with you yet. I come to tell somebody, I know it's been I know it's been tough. I know you felt like throwing in the towel. But God told me to tell you, hang on in there. Look at somebody say, hang on in there. For I heard the Bible say, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in new season, we shall reap if you faint not. Grab somebody. And say, neighbor, hold on to ceiling. It's here right now. You cried and you cried. You worked and you worked. You waited and you waited. You served and you served. And God told me to tell you, it's a new season. It's a new day. A fresh anointing has come your way. 
everybody on this life journey when the enemy try to bring discouragement and threats to you just remember this be not dismayed what else? Two, three, 
to church you right now. To admit that you may have been under attack. We saw Jezebel attack Ahab. We saw Jezebel attack the prophet. And some of you don't realize what you've been dealing with is really the spirit of Jezebel that wants you to quit. But tonight is a night of mass deliverance. I don't want you to be cool and cute or tricky right now. I need you to be honest. You can't get delivered if you're not honest. You being attacked is not something to be ashamed of. Because really, the attack really indicates that God's hand is on you. Jezebel doesn't attack somebody that don't have it going on. She attacks those in authority that have promise, that have power, that have glory. And tonight we're going to break that spirit. We're going we're gonna to walk in deliverance. I want to do this like the Holy Ghost showed it to me. You don't even have to come all the way down here. You can if you so desire. But I need you to step out of your seat into the nearest aisle. Into the nearest aisle. If you need this deliverance, you've been under attack. I don't care if it's a physical attack, emotional, a mental, a financial, a spiritual attack. Whatever it is, step out in the aisle now. I even sense that the Holy Ghost too was dry up in the room. Hey, shout out to the devil. Some of you cannot sleep at night. God said, I'm going to give you peace that pass all understanding. I don't have time to lay my hand on everybody, but let me tell you something. God is already here. And so it doesn't matter if I can touch you or not. What really matters is, is that you touch God. You're going to touch God with your faith and with your praise tonight. And your praise doesn't have to be anything in particular. Even some of you just need to cry out to God. Some of you need to shout out to God. Glory to God. I feel a release in this place tonight. When I count to three, I want us to go back into that anointing, that glory. I want you to forget about everything and everybody in this place and lay hold of your deliverance, lay hold of the glory of God that is about to hit your life. Are you ready in this room? What? Two, three, now come on!
Jason Tulanis. And there's a third person that's left out and come them in that circle. Some people, where they were, at what point they were in their life. But some funerals just got canceled tonight. Glory to God. And I want you, while you're holding their hands, I want you to look at them in their eyeball, look at their soul, look at their spirit. And you're going to shout one word. I want you to say it with power, authority, and anointing. When you declare this, that's going to be something that's going to break in this place tonight. Will change their life forever. You got the hand, are you ready? That one word is, I don't want you to be cute with it, I want you to shout it until you say it down in their soul. And then after you shout this word, I want you to praise God because you believe it's your word. You ready? When I count to three, I want you to shout, live, all right? One, two, three, now shout.
transition to me. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Oh my God. What would you do if I told you that the control that Jezebel has had over you as of tonight is over? the same struggle. You come out because you're a man, you're a woman, but people really don't know the struggle that you have. They don't know the nights that you couldn't sleep tossing and turning, not sure what's going to be next. But God said tonight, I'm not through with you. Don't give up on God. I don't know about this so I'm glad God didn't give up on me. God didn't give up on me. I lose the spirit of encouragement in this place. I lose encouragement in this place. I felt heavy discouragement when I came in the room. Tonight, God is lifting you. He's baptizing you. With a fresh enough. Sometimes we grow weary. If we didn't grow weary, Paul wouldn't have no need to say it. Let us not grow weary in well doing. But we'll reap in due season if we faint not. Look, somebody tell you, you can't give up now. It's all right, brother. You're not funny because you're embracing another brother. Tell me you can't give up. So much. It gives you so wonderful. Thank you for staying and painting. Get ready to take my seat. But please don't want to leave. I need to do two things. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, there, there's so much deliverance in this house. Oh my God. I almost feel like an old fashioned revival just laying on the altar, letting God complete His work. See, we rush out of church too quick sometimes. I heard the man of the, my brother testify how the woman walked seven hours praying. What if she had gotten weary? Could it be those seven hours is what caused this baby girl? Love flows because God is in control. A church where God is really real. Hi, my name is Dennis Rogers, pastor here at the Greater New Bible Word Church of God in Christ. I would like to welcome you to our services. Service times are Sunday morning prayer and Sunday school, 9 a.m. Sunday morning worship, 11 a.m. Sunday evening Pentecostal service, 7 p.m. Midweek service, Thursday, 7